emotional intelligence in the classroom and maybe even outside of the classroom is such an important topic to discuss. Um, I do think that teachers need to know the skills, first of all, for themselves, like what does emotional intelligence mean being a teacher, but then also using instruction and designing lessons that's also going to assist our learners in developing emotional intelligence. But more importantly, almost, if you're a teacher looking towards promotion, wanting to become an HOD or a deputy principal or maybe even a principal, being in a leadership position, emotional intelligence is very important. So um, I thought let's try and discuss this topic with an expert. So what we'll be doing today is I'm interviewing Jacqueline Etchinson, who is the executive head of the Edu Inc. School. And uh, she's also currently doing her master's degree, uh, writing a thesis or well, a dissertation on emotional intelligence and leadership and what that looks like in the school environment, what that looks like in the classroom. Um, and I really think that there's a lot of value for you, especially in knowing how can we improve the emotional intelligence of ourselves, our learners and the community. If you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, I'd love for you to do that. Hit that like button. It really helps out the channel. But more importantly, let's have a discussion in the comments. Let's see what you think about emotional intelligence and all of the wisdom that Jacqueline shares with us. Stay super. Jacqueline Aitchison, a returning guest on the podcast. Uh, it's amazing to have you back and to join us uh, in the podcast today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Francois. It's good to see you again. So, Jax, we had a discussion uh, offline and had uh, a bit of a chat around leadership and what it is that's necessary, especially for our novice leaders, you know, the people who are in deputy principal roles or in HOD positions, or even those aspiring teachers who know you want to go into school management. And we, we had offline such a great discussion on what is needed and what do, you, what do we think within educational institutions needs to happen to assist our novice leaders in schools to progress up until the level of becoming school principals. And of course, you and your husband owning a private school of your own is in a, a great position to assist us with this information. But then also, um, I know you're currently busy with a master's degree in education, specifically focusing on leadership. So I thought it should be so good to have a discussion with you. Let's record it for the podcast, because I believe there's so many uh, deputy principals and other leaders in schools that can benefit from our discussion, but I have to ask you this very important question. What made you decide to do a formal master's study on this kind of topic? Oh, Francois, I don't know. <laughs> I've only got a couple of months left and I'm, I'm definitely wondering if it was the best decision because you know yourself from doing it. Um, sure, it's not an easy journey. It's quite mm. overwhelming, the amount of reading, um, but I have to say, I've, I really, really have loved doing it. It's been so stimulating, just the, the amount of reading that we've already implemented within the school in terms of training, because it is in leadership and education. And um, I'm doing it through a UK university, so I'm getting quite a nice global perspective yeah. uh, on the whole thing. And yo, my focus, my personal focus is on emotional intelligence in school leadership. Uh, and it really, the, the further I've gone down that rabbit hole, the more I've seen that it's just, it really is the first step. Whether you just want to be a teacher because that's what you've decided your career is going to be, or whether you want to go through all those ranks into that position of leadership, it's just not going to happen without that development of the emotional intelligence that, that comes with it. it um, yeah, as I say, it's a rabbit hole. Once you start going down that rabbit hole, it just, it's a fascinating topic. Um, so yeah, masters is tough. Masters is tricky. But I have loved doing it, um, although I am looking forward to the middle of February when this is done and dusted. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the kind of discussion I, I hear from many PhD students and master's students who come to the end of the journey. And it's almost like these last six months, uh, you sure. feel like, okay, I've now spent a lot of time uh, in my life, professional life, yeah. dealing with this one topic, because that's what a postgraduate study is. It's really... Yeah 
going niche and going deep within a very specific field more than so in your post grad or just the, the leisurely reading about a topic. Um, so you do get saturated with all of this information, but, um, and I've, I've had a previous discussion as well uh, with other master students on the podcast. And I think it's important that we use platforms like this popular social media platforms to disseminate yeah. some of the findings or the relationships or the, the information that we find in our studies, because who really reads our dissertations? Who really reads our publications <laughs> yeah the only people who actually read the dissertations are the, the guys who have to sign them off and say yes award the degree <laughs> i don't think anybody actually reads the whole thing and I, and I spoke about this in a previous podcast as well. I think there's probably 10 people in total who read my PhD thesis, but it's yeah. up to me to use my social media platforms to take the information that I gathered out of the PhD and then share that. Um, and I think that's the, the reason for podcasts like this. So thank you very much for the opportunity for chatting about your master study and one of the things that you now saturated yourself in around emotional intelligence um, and especially within school leadership. So, Jax, let, let's start off, like, let's define what emotional intelligence is um, and specifically why it is so important for, for the school environment. Well, emotional intelligence, uh, people have been discussing it for a while now. Uh, you know, they started 1990, there was, um, Salovey and Mayo started that in 1990, but it was really classified more as a social intelligence at that point, it, it, it sort of fell under that umbrella of social intelligence. By the time Daniel Goleman took, took over the whole thing in, in 1995, he published that first book on emotional intelligence and he created quite a, it, it, it was a little controversial because that was the first time somebody, a psychologist, a researcher went out there and said, well, actually emotional intelligence is a better predictor of success than your cognitive ability. So that, got people quite up in arms because, you know, even in education up until that point, people my age will remember when we were at school, at some point, maybe by the end of primary school, we had done an IQ test and the belief was that IQ was fixed. And that IQ score that we got at the end of primary school went onto our file and that was it. That was it for the rest of our school career. We were pigeonholed according to what our IQ score our filed IQ score was. Now we know over the years that has changed quite considerably. Um, we, we talk so often now about growth mindset. That's everywhere. And the fact that our, our ability to improve our IQs, um, increase that IQ score through the brain's plasticity and all of that, so the neuroplasticity, these are things that are happening all the time. And we can actually create neural pathways and, and um, increase our, our capacity to learn. Um, so things have changed quite significantly in that regard. What has also been really interesting in the emotional intelligence space is that because this has become such a prolific topic in terms of the importance of it and, and the significance of it in terms of predicting success in the workplace, in the school, for children, for adults, um, the studies are becoming more and more specific. So they're even starting to, to get into places where you, you differentiate between trait EI and ability EI and which of those is a great particular predictor of success and which can be worked on, which can not really be worked on, which are more, more default states for us as human beings, um, which we can actually work with. So, I mean, it's a fascinating field of study and it's a huge field of study. The applications are, are very expensive, as I say, from young to old, through corporate, into schools, you name it. The emotional intelligence, EI, EQ, whatever you want to be calling it, seems to be recognized now as an absolutely fundamental factor for any form of growth or success and happiness, ultimately, because it's based on the first point that they always talk about is your self-awareness as being part of um, emotional intelligence. And it's your self-awareness that's the cornerstone for your own self-fulfillment, happiness, all of those sort of things. So that's really where it starts. And, um, you know, even if we take it right back to the context of schools, teachers, potential leaders, current leaders, it's your self-awareness that determines how happy you'll be in your career from the point of view that if you are self-aware, the very first thing you can do is decide what your career trajectory is going to look like. 
what you think will work for you instead of falling into the trap of, oh, but everybody else does it this way. I'm expected to do it that way. Or I can't just be a teacher for the rest of my life. I'm supposed to be a leader at some point, which is nonsense. Yeah. There are people out there who are very, very happy in the classroom. It's where they are at their best. So they want to be career teachers and they're okay with being career teachers. I just want to, I just want to interject here. I think I think what you said up to now is absolutely amazing, especially in the sense that um, we started off in the with the with the conversation around emotional intelligence in the '90s, um, and the fact that it's been called an intelligence. I think that's where the controversy mostly stems from. But in many cases, it it comes down to these semantics between you know what it's being called, and but that doesn't matter. What I think everybody has agreed on is that being able to manage your emotions and being aware of your emotions is just as important as the actual skill of the job that you're doing or the activity that you are doing. Yes. So it's that ability to recognize what you feel, to manage what you feel, and to use that to be productive. But that's only the first side of it. The second side of is, is the capacity to do that with the people you're interacting with as well. In other words, to recognize what they are feeling um, to, to take cognizance of it and to take account of it within a, a situation that you're dealing with and then to manage the situation as a, uh, as a whole because, the, because you now understand how you are reacting and how they are reacting. So and for a long time in the 90s, it was just the first side. It was how I am reacting, and my, but now they've developed it into to, to the people that you're interacting with as well. And the, the utility of this, and I think this is the thing, because in, in many cases, it becomes this academic debate. But for yes. the teachers watching and for our, our, our listenership who work in schools every day, the utility of emotional intelligence is super mm -hmm. important because uh, at a bare basic level, it assists you with classroom management. That many of the challenges that occurs in a class that maybe disrupts a lesson or get, gets kids off track um, is... Yeah of the, the 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 emotional state of the individual but also then that of the class and that of the teacher so once teachers understand how to use emotions or how to i also want to say identify the yeah. the, the ruling emotion in the person you're working with that gives you yeah. a lead to what to do in order to manage the classroom appropriately 100% and it, this this is this is the rabbit hole that you start going down because when you really start delving into all of this, you start to, to see relationships and patterns in the classroom when you watch the dynamics between the people. So a teacher who is not as self-aware as they could be, who perhaps doesn't recognize the triggers, their own triggers in a classroom space, will have a child who, who engages that trigger, the teacher reacts, because they're not as self-aware as they could be and they're not managing that emotion very, very well. Um, and of course, then you go down the whole thing of the child gets a fright or the, the you know, teacher responds, the child, she might raise her voice, she might snap at something. Um, and then you have the whole amygdala response of the child where it shuts down and then the same thing's happening with the children around and there's a, there's a, they perceive the threat, the brain perceives the threat, everybody's shutting down. So it gets very technical and it gets, it, it really is that rabbit hole, but when you start seeing it in action, you're able to then step back and go, oh, good grief. Look what's happening here. And you, you come at it from a far more meta perspective. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're standing sideways and you, 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 you're seeing the whole thing unravel in front of you. Then you are now moving into a space where you can manage a situation. You're recognizing what's going on in the room and you are managing it. That really is what's happening when you're developing your own emotional intelligence. So as a teacher, and you've just mentioned like from a career trajectory, uh, we've got many student teachers who are getting into the profession now and needs to make mm -hmm. a decision on, well, what's the future of my career going to look like? It doesn't need to be yeah. uh, uh, mapped out specifically, uh, but at least when you start off as a teacher, or maybe you haven't done that yet and you're somewhere in your yeah. career uh, in a junction, you need to make a decision. Well, in which direction do I want to move? Do I want to yeah. go? as a teacher and remain a classroom teacher and become a content specialist or a pedagogical specialist yes. and yes. see my days out as a teacher in the classroom? Or do I want to take a more leadership managerial role in a school and go the, the way of 
HOD, deputy principal, principal. Um, right. So you, you you mentioned that self awareness in that in that instance is key. How do we yes. how do we go about developing that kind of of uh, self awareness, especially when it comes to our careers? I think it takes a lot of reflection, especially when you're starting out on that journey, because when we are young and we go into that new environment. We are so busy doing what's expected of us. We're not spending a whole lot of time really working out if this is what we signed up for, if this is where we want to keep going, or are we just falling into that hamster wheel? You know, that rut, that, that especially in an academic year. An academic year is, is so pattern-based. It becomes a rut very, very quickly. Well, in January, we do this, and then in February, there's the open day, and then in March, there's the this, and then there's a the holiday, and then... Academic years do that. There's the roller coaster of tension as we go into exams and then it comes down. It's very pattern based. So that means it's very easy to fall into a rut. It's also very easy to do that when you're in quite a big school and you've got HODs and things above you who, who are giving you your tests, they're giving you your exams. You're not having to really exert yourself in the space. You know, most of us know about the learning pit, for example. We don't get necessarily put into a place of frustration that learning then stems from. Mm -hmm. And that can become quite a, a grind, can become frustrating. So that's why reflection in that space is absolutely vital. Reflection is not something we stop doing when we finish the PGCE or the teaching degree and we, you know, we don't hand the journals in anymore. <laughs> we actually need to do it with depth. We've got to put ourselves into that uncomfortable position, asking ourselves the tricky questions like, Am I cut out to be a teacher who stands in the classroom and I want to, as you said, pursue a very academic track? So I'm going to become a specialist in my subject or within an age group of children, or I'm going to expand to the point where I become an IEB examiner or a moderator or, you know, really push myself on an academic track? Or do I feel that I want to, I'm a good administrator? And I'm, I'm organized and I get a lot of, I derive satisfaction from that level of, of organization and systems and, and that sort of thing. And I'm good with, with systems organization. I'm good with, with seeing where bottlenecks happen in systems and then creating streamlined um, you know, manners of, of fixing these things. If I'm good at that, then I should be looking at a managerial role. Hmm. Uh, or am I good at big picture? Am I good at looking at a strategy and actually affecting that strategy because then I'm looking at a leadership role and that's very different from a manager's role. Mm -hmm. So a manager is trained in complicated thinking, you know, complicated thinking where things are step by step. I mean, a rocket ship is complicated, but if you follow the steps, you'll end up with a rocket ship. Um, complex thinking is, is, is different because it, it involves the human element. It's, it's messier. It require you know, a difficult conversation with a parent is a, is a complex situation because you're dealing with so many more variables and they're all moving at the same time. That's what leaders do. So you've got those three different paths when you're a new teacher. Am I going to go academic? Am I going to go managerial? Or am I going to go leadership? And you cannot know which one you're going to go down unless you constantly take stock create a checkpoint and say, right, it's time for me to reflect on my term, my academic year. What were my highlights? What were my lowlights? What do I want to keep doing? Start doing, stop doing all of those questions, because it definitely starts painting a picture in terms of, you know what, I'm enjoying this space and I'm good at it. So how do I do more of that in a more meaningful, significant manner? And I think what that it results the, the, the important thing here is that you also need to get the opportunity to be exposed to those kind of environments. Yes. So the self-awareness, first of all, is making or knowing what the options are that's available to me, whether I'm going to be, mm -hmm. you know, the academic track, managerial track, leadership track. Yes, leadership but track. in many cases, if you're not, if you're not exposed to, you're not giving the, given the opportunity to be in those environments, there's no way yes. for you to really realize that, oh, okay, this is something I enjoy or not. So how do we give our novice teachers, and I don't mean like student teachers, I mean some teachers who've now been taught, teaching, uh, teaching for two years, three years, four years, who now want to start exploring. They found their feet in the classroom, so to say, yeah. and now they need to start exploring the managerial stuff. How do we give 
um, as school leaders, how do we give these staff members the opportunities to, to gain the experience of manager, yeah. managing or leadership? Well, this, the first step is uh, a little bit of confidence because remember that when your leaders and managers are running the school, as much as they are trying themselves to demonstrate social awareness, which is the empathy required to, to manage your staff, seeing where their heads are at, they can't read your mind. So if you are thinking this is a track that you would like to pursue or, or just explore to see if it's something you would like, you have to communicate that. Mm -hmm. You've got to communicate that with the people who are able to assist you. Just like a good leader has a posse of people around them that they bounce things with, they have a mentor. As the young teacher looking to explore a track, find your mentor, find your person who will let you sit in a difficult parent meeting if you're thinking you want to see how that works maybe ask one of your one of your senior staff would it be possible for me to sit in a new parent interview you know a potential parent interview i would just i'm done some heads are going to say yes some heads are going to say no but they will never know unless you ask and you won't know if you can do that you might sit through one interview and go oh no not a chance not my cup of tea i don't want to ever sit on that side of the desk and do that um, and so you can't know, though, unless you put yourself out there, communicate it to the next one in the line and go and actually expose yourself to it. Good. I mean, I, I like remember that, taking, taking the agency in that if I yes. am considering this, it's like raising my hand and saying, can I get a little bit more responsibility? Like I've now yes. nailed the classroom environment. I'm a good teacher, but I want to explore managing. I want to explore leadership. So give me a small responsibility to prove myself in and get the experience yeah. of in this, in being assisted by a mentor. For sure. You know, if I think of, of some of the complicated tasks that, that deputy, our deputy does, for example, it's things like the timetabling and the invigilation timetables. And I promise you, if a teacher comes in there and says to him, can I assist you with this? Because I'd really like to see how it works. He will be more than happy for that person to come in and assist because it is a tricky, tricky job. People don't understand the, the nuances and intricacy of timetabling until they sit down and do that. But if you are thinking about a management track, for sure, go in and say, can I come and help you with that this term or this year or whatever it is? And, you know, get exposed to it. Because then being in the situation, you realize, oh, this is actually interesting. This is challenging me. I really enjoy this. Or as you said, no way. I don't want to do this. this Let me rather explore something else. So let's yeah. take the agency. So the novice teachers out there or the, 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 the people aspiring to go into some leadership or managerial roles, raise your hand and say, give me a little bit more responsibility. Exactly, because what happens then is there's a, an overflow effect. So let's take the timetabling example. Uh, let's imagine the scenario that the deputy says, yes, absolutely, come and get involved and help me with this timetable. And the two of you sit and you hash it out and you sort it out and it gets given to the staff. And invariably, it's going to happen. Someone's going to be grumpy about the timetable. Not every, <laughs> someone's going to be grumpy. So at that point, the, the new teacher gets their first taste of somebody who's not really happy with something that they've produced. And at that point, she goes, she or he goes back to the, the mentor or the deputy or the phase head or whoever they've been working with at that point. And the mentoring begins because the teacher's then saying, did I do something wrong? Because mm -hmm. that person's unhappy. And that's the opportunity to say, no, this is how you handle situations like this and this is how you handle a difficult conversation and this is how you so all of that training is now starting to snowball it feels like it's a little bit of a hidden curriculum but it's starting there that mentoring's happening and automatically that staff member is starting to elevate without even really having to do much it, it's almost like being being bootstrapped up it's like being uh, yes. pulled by your own, by your own like shoelaces um, exactly it, you get elevated into these things. You don't necessarily realize it, but gradually you're developing these, these skills. But Jax, yes. uh, we started off with, with self-awareness. Of course, self-awareness yes. is a very important yeah. aspect of emotional intelligence. What, what are the other um, like traits or, or, or pillars of emotional intelligence that school leaders need to, need to look to develop? So according to Goldman, um, the, the self-awareness comes first and then the second one is the self-management because we still get 
plenty of people who are aware of how they react to certain situations, but their response to that is, well, that's who I am. That's how I do it. And that's not managing yourself particularly well. Um, so that's, that's the second pillar. It's your ability to manage the emotions that you've then identified. The third pillar would be your social awareness. And that's when you're flipping it onto the other person, your ability to read the other people in a room for the sole purpose of furthering the situation and creating a constructive space. And I think, again, this is where training is required and this is where people fall down sometimes because when they perceive some threat, maybe it's a parent who's not happy with marks or feels that something hasn't been done to the, to the level that they would prefer and they go on the attack, the, you, 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 it can happen that you, you go back to the default of defense instead of trying to elevate yourself above it and read the situation. Because when you start reading, it gets very interesting. You know, um, as a leader, you're sitting in a difficult meeting and you, once you've practiced this a while, you're seeing that person's emotion coming at you and you're able to read, okay, she's very, very angry about this particular mark, but she hasn't paid her school fees for the last three months. So is that what this is actually about? And it teaches you to manage a situation, getting yourself to the crux of the matter in a non-threatening manner and creating um, a positive outcome for everybody in the room. Mm. So again, that's a very uh, intricate one. It's a deep one. It's one that takes time to really learn. And I don't think we ever stop learning these things. I think these skills develop continuously as long as we engage with, with other people. And then the last one is the social skills. And that's just your ability to handle the situation, handle the other person's emotions. And again, it comes with its own set of intricacies. Handling is, is, I don't know, it doesn't feel like a very positive word that I don't want to handle people. That feels like a bad salesman, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's that ability to just empathize to the point of seeing what's in front of you and then manage a situation. You know, a few years back, um, we were in the very unfortunate position of having to ask a child to leave. There'd been a, 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 an incident at the school. And it's, you know, it's a horrible feeling because it doesn't really matter what's happened. You always end up feeling like a bit of a failure. I failed. I got this wrong. For whatever reason, this hasn't worked. But we handled it in such a manner that when the parents left, we still had a relationship to the point that they are still in contact with the school. They still come in with other um, projects that we work in with the school. They've linked the school with a, an extramural program that we've now brought into the school. So the relationship is intact. Mm. And that's the example that I use whenever I'm speaking to my staff about how to manage difficult conversations. You are not a doormat, but being disagreeing over a point doesn't mean that anybody in that scenario has to become disagreeable. You can manage a very dis a difficult conversation, a very difficult situation in a manner that is still constructive, positive, and has a good outcome. Ultimately, in my mind, you've got to have your social skills to the point where you don't create an us and them. You know, we, we're, we're schools, we're teachers. We have one objective, and that is the best interest of the child in the room. We can always chunk it up to that common ground. Mm. So whatever disagreements and things are happening at this level, we can always go back to what we are both sitting here for, and it's the best interests of that child. And when you work from that premise, you learn how to manage these situations that they are ultimately constructive. As you know, obviously, it doesn't always work like that, but you know, if you if you're hitting a if your your batting average is a nine out of ten, I think you're doing pretty well. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think that's very important. And there's a lot of value that you've already shared uh, with us during this discussion. And with the starting with the premise that if you want to be a school leader, if you want to go into school management, or school leadership, that emotional intelligence is important. And the, the quicker we get to develop that, uh, the yeah. better for us long term. So getting onto that trajectory of developing our emotional intelligence, that's not only good for school leaders, it's of course, also very good yes. For, for teachers in the classroom, as we said, from a classroom management point of view. But what do we do, um, especially if I'm a if I'm a HOD or I am a deputy principal and I want to become a principal, but yeah. 
my own principle is 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 is, is being the roadblock or the, <laughs> the, the 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 chain of command is being the roadblock and they're seeing me as a threat because all of this is i'm trying to improve yes. myself and now i'm becoming threatening to yeah. a leader like how do we how do i uh, uh, approach that or deal with the with the challenge of being seen as a threat it's a tricky one and it's always it's always out there. The possibility of that happening is very real because you might be taking the time and putting in the effort to develop your own emotional intelligence, but that doesn't mean everybody else is doing the same thing. And that's when that perception of threat starts to rear its head. So, you know, I think then you've got to again, take a step back, look at your career trajectory and what your plan is and try and be strategic about it. If you're sitting in an HOD position and you want to move into deputy, or if you're a deputy and you want to move into the heads position, have a look at your CV and have a look at how long you've been in that position for, for a start. Because if, if you've only got a year or two in that position, it doesn't make sense for you to be putting your CV out looking to, to jump to the next one. You, you're not going to be taken seriously. There's a credibility issue at that point because unfortunately your experience is just not going to take you over the finish line looking for that new job. So try and be as strategic as possible. If you're sitting, you're a deputy, you want to move into a heads position and you've got two years of deputy, think to yourself, okay, realistically, I need another couple of years at least doing this. Maybe in year four or five, I can put my CV out. But in the interim, what else can I do as self-development to keep myself stimulated in this position, to keep myself feeling, feeling fulfilled? Because yes, there's going to be a lot of frustration there. So you've got to manage yourself within that capacity in such a manner that you can keep going because ultimately you want your CV to reflect what it needs to reflect so that you can make the move. You put your CVs out in year four or five and you get exactly what you want because everything has been strategically planned. But that in the interim, that self-development is key. Don't wait for anybody else to do it for you. Don't wait for the school to offer you a course. Go and look for the course and yes, pay for it yourself because ultimately this is about you and your career and no one's gonna make that happen except you. And if you're stuck in that in that kind of position, I mean, it's part of the the social intelligence, that social awareness. Yeah. That well, I've, I'm trying to develop the emotional intelligence, but the chain of command above me, they don't they don't care about it. They don't want to develop the emotional intelligence to allow me to do it. So just bear with it and interact emotionally intelligent in that environment. Because if you're now going to keep kick up a storm about well, yeah. my my, my principal is not giving me the opportunity. My, the deputy is 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 trying to to stymie me. Like that's yeah. not going to play in your favor. It's rather like be be humble about it. Step a little bit back and and do the time. Like get yeah. the, get the experience you need so that you can move on in two yeah. three years time. And it is difficult. It is difficult because you we all want to go to a workplace where we feel happy and stimulated. And unfortunately, the scenario you're describing happens quite frequently. Um, but this is where your ability to step up and your character is key because that capacity for, for being the bigger person, just as you say, if you're going to start kicking up a fuss, think about what the reference is going to look like or sound like when you do put the CV out and they phone the deputy or the head and they ask for the reference. What are they going to be saying about you? What would you like them to be saying about you at that point? And there are other ways that you can use your own emotional intelligence development constructively. You can be doing it with children. You can be doing it with colleagues. You can be having conversations about it in the staff room. Hey guys, I found this amazing site, positive psychology, and it's all about this and that. You can be stimulating yourself so as not to feel, oh, I don't wanna get up. I don't wanna to go to work you know, that's a choice. That's a decision that you are making. Yeah. And what, what I found is this is exactly the reason why we've created the support group for teachers and for, for school leaders is that you need to become part of a community of other individuals who feel exactly the same way, who's on the same trajectory as you. Um, and that's why we do the online meetings every every second week with the group of, of teachers. We get together and we have these kind of discussions. So if you'd like to become part 
of the mastermind just uh, pop me an email i'll put all of the the descriptions uh, in the in the video so if there are any teachers out there who would like to become part of a professional learning network of people looking to become principals mm -hmm. or you want to engage mm -hmm. in leadership by all means reach out and we can do that but uh Jax, what what would you say is your ultimate goal like because your your master's degree is a stepping stone towards something yeah. else there's a reason why you did this why what would you like to see uh, yourself uh, achieve because of the study you've just uh, you, you're busy with you know ultimately i would really like to be able to effect more change in terms of how emotional intelligence is viewed in south africa within the school leadership space because we have no training regarding emotional intelligence in the leadership space. In fact, we have no training in the classroom space in, with regards to EI or in the teaching space. So in the States, for example, they do cell programs, social emotional learning. They have programs that are part of their curriculum and some districts meet with great success and others not so much. It's like everything else. It depends on who's facilitating the programs, but globally, there is still a very serious lack. There's lots of studies showing that teachers and leaders are desperate for emotional learning. They want that EI training, especially when they start moving up into the leadership positions. That ability to manage the level of stress that you have in that top position in a school. Your, your emotional intelligence really needs to be pretty rock solid if you're going to manage that without any other, you know, I mean, look at the fallout we saw in, in COVID, the, the absolute spike in stress related heart attacks and strokes and all of that depression, everything else. So my, my, what I would love to see happening is that we can start introducing more of these programs so that when people do want to step up the ladder, it's actually part of their training. It, it should be integrated into curricula, as far as I'm concerned. It should be, even at PGCE level, there should be an entire module at least. Everything, in my opinion, should be underpinned by emotional intelligence, but I might be slightly biased, so I could settle for a module. <laughs> if we can get a module in there on it, it would help. It's a starting point. I think the teachers would be so better equipped going into the classroom if they had some of that guidance and knowledge you know, the, then it's moving up and they move into a grade head position. They don't spend the first six months going, you know, with the whole imposter syndrome going, you know, should I be here? And how long will it take before somebody realizes I can't do this? We could be leapfrogging those hurdles if we just were trained better in advance and then constant EI support, especially for the, the top leadership of the schools. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. You know, what you're doing with your get togethers every couple of weeks they are absolutely vital for people we cannot do this in a vacuum and we cannot do it alone if we are going to be effective when working with children we have to do it collectively there is no way we can do this by ourselves we have such good ideas as groups we have such good support as groups there's no reason to be doing it by ourselves mm. um you know and the, the further up the chain you go the, the, the greater the need for that collaboration and mentorship that you have. You know, I often say to our teachers and our kids, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So choose those five very, very carefully. You want that person who's going to challenge you. And the further up the ladder you go, the fewer people will challenge you. But you need a couple of people around you who are going to keep pushing you and then keep challenging you and tell you, you know what, step back. You, this is a brain fart. Move along. <laughs> You've got to have that person, you know. So you 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 keep your posse around you. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my idea. Get some more of this into the curricula. Get more training on the EI. It's absolutely fundamental to fulfillment, to happiness, to success, to all the good things that we're looking for in life. So, Jax, if people want to go out and like find out a bit more about you and, and see the work that you're doing, where can they go to, uh, to follow you on social media? Well, LinkedIn's always a good place. I'm there on LinkedIn. Um, and our marketing team are very, very good at putting out a whole lot of things that we do on LinkedIn. Um, I generally write articles and they generally get published on LinkedIn as well, um, education-related articles. You know, the school's called Edu Inc., but we have an Edu Think channel. 
that the articles go through. And the point of those articles is to stimulate conversation and ed education. It's not, it's not to have people agree with me or whatever, it's to stimulate conversation. We want to talk more about education because if we're talking about education, it's front of mind, people are thinking about it, doing it, they're active within it. Absolutely. So what I'll do is I'll put the links to your social media. I'll put that in the description of this video so that everybody can go out and follow the amazing work that you that you guys do at Edu Inc. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing some of this community moving over and uh, looking at or reading the, the articles that you write. And of course, the podcast that you do. And I think that's something that more schools need to do is starting their own podcast. Um, really, yeah. really interesting what you guys at Edu Inc. Uh, do. Jax, thank you very much for the time that you spent with me uh, today. Um, and on behalf of all of the teachers that you empower through your leadership, thank you for allowing us to teach like the superheroes that we are. Oh, Francois, thank you so much for having me. Um, I could sit here for the next three hours because I get so excited about the topic. So thank you for the platform. Thank you for letting me waffle on about it. And um, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing because it, it really is fantastic. Thanks, Jax. Stay super.